All right, I told you that big old long story. And the whole point of that was, I don't know, don't screw up. Uh, we're gonna talk about valve springs. Valve springs, well, their entire purpose, of course, is to close the valve. Um, I don't need to write Valve operates about 20 to 30 times a second in intake valve open one time for every 720 degrees. So if the engine is running at 2600 RPM, then the valve opens 1300 times a minute. So close the valve. It's going to run. Huh? I was just saying vibrating. Vibrating. Yes, actually. Um, so it's, uh, it's supposed to close the valve. It's obviously going to keep the valve closed when not open by the cam. Um, so be, uh, usually two or three springs per, per valve, not per cylinder. That would be weird if I had three springs per cylinder. And if you don't have the correct number of springs, then you can get into a resonance, which will cause the valve to float. Floating means that it's when the rocker arm hits it, instead of it following the rocker arm constantly, it'll kind of bash it down, and then the rocker arm closes, and then it comes back and hits it again. It gets into a resonance where it's not opening or closing. Along with the cam, it's doing it at its own time. So. That is why that particular engine, the 0200, had to have three valve springs in it. Um, let me see. Oh, yeah, this is funny. I'm usually wound in opposite directions. So if one goes clockwise, the other one's going to go counterclockwise. Um, they are, I'm going to move this over if everybody's cool. They are often um, dampened um, or progressive. <coughs> Which means um, the bottom is wound tighter. And the top. And I showed you in class. It's actually kind of tricky to, to see it. You, uh, I honestly I have a hard time just picking up a valve spring and going, oh yeah, that's tighter than up there. I always have to use a little pin or something. And where the spring actually stops, I put my pin right there and then kind of see if that and look where the it stops at the other side and look at that. And uh, like I showed you in lab, otherwise it's really difficult to see. Uh, let's see. There's a, what's that? Dampened. Like, you know, like you got it wet, but that's not what it means. Multiple springs prevent valve float. That's where you take root beer and you put it on the valve. They are held in place by lower and upper uh, spring seats. Yeah, I'll call it spring seat. Spring. Don't forget the upper is off sometimes uh, rotocoil if it's in a continental rotocoil. So I guess that's all the little parts of the cylinder that I can think of to talk about. And the many different ways you can screw something up. Although while I'm thinking about it, one of the worst ways to screw something up, it's stupid, is uh, when you're building a six cylinder engine, all six cylinder engines, you gotta put the rocker shaft in before you put the cylinder on. You don't have to put the rocker arms in 
but you've got to put the rocker shaft in because you have a cylinder here, got one here, one here, and all these are kind of lined up, but they're not lined up. Mm. You can't put a shaft in this way, this way, this way. There's not enough room between these two to put one in and slide it in. There's enough room between them, this is the middle one, to move it out and put a rocker arm in. There's enough room to go that way and put a rocker arm in, but you ain't gonna do it. Even if you have angle head cylinders, where the rocker shafts are very short and they go in at an angle, uh, still not enough room. I want to see. I think Continental there is. It's been so long since I've done one. I think you can do it on Continental because they've actually chamfered them now so you can get them out. But definitely not like coming. <laughs> I got a call from somebody one time. Hey, um, I'm building a six cylinder like homing. Is there a trick to getting the rocker shafts in once the cylinders are all on? Okay. If you call somebody and ask that question, I mean, it's good that you ask for advice, but my, I'm going to tell you right now, my first thought in my head is, yeah, I shouldn't have been doing this. You haven't been trained to do it and you're doing it by yourself and you didn't read the book, which clearly tells you to do it. So I will think bad things, but then my answer will simply be, well, ah, it's simple. You get them out by taking the cylinder back off. That's how you get them out, which ruins your whole torque procedure. And so it's like, you really screwed up. But unfortunately, this guy's answer was, yeah, I don't know. I'm just going to grind it till it fits. Uh, Thanks for your advice. And he wasn't joking. So. You hear the grinding machine in the background? Yep. <laughs> It'll be fine. I can't see that it would be a problem. All right. Let's move on to the valve train. which starts back in the bottom end of the aircraft. And so we talked about the valve train. It starts with the cam. Technically the cam. I was going to say camshaft. I thought, well, radial engines don't have camshafts. But so we can say cam, camshaft, or cam ring would be the uh, appropriate word. So, but I guess that goes along with my notes because I wrote here, I wrote it, it rotates. But this isn't accurate. Wow. All right, I'll do this and I'll tell you why. Rotates at one half of crank speed. Asterisk. So I always say the camshaft of the, is the uh, brains and the crank shaft is the brawn because the crank shaft just makes the rods go back and forth. That's all it knows. But the camshaft is the brains of the operation, which has to know when to open and close valves. So that makes it the brains. Uh, a, so there's a cam rotates. There are two types of cams. We have the one, the cam ring. And this is for radial engines. Why? Because all of the cylinders are in a row. And if I had a shaft that was four feet long and all of these are in one row, well, that's not going to work. I have to get a push rod that comes down and way over and down. So there is a ring. You have one. I didn't bring it in here. But it's just, it's a ring. It has ramps all over it. And it does not necessarily, it just doesn't, rotate at one half of crank speed. There's this whole calculation you can do about how many lobes it has on it. will determine how fast it rotates. It has two tracks. Now I got a whole thing about that, so I can just wait that. Anyway, so the cam ring, radial engines, I'll put that not one half crank speed. That's my asterisk. Ass who? Um, and then we have the cam shaft. which is for, oh, I see, I even wrote a note there. You should put this down here. Um, camshaft used for all other engines. And obviously the cam shaft or fall, uh, cam ring uses lobes to press on followers
I'll just finish it. To press on lobe, to press on followers. Uh, that press on push rods. That press on rocker arms. that press on valves or that open valves. There we go. A cam shaft. This is a Lycoming camshaft that has an integral drive gear. This is the way they make them now. Let's see, this is an interesting color, this pink and chrome. Why is it pink and chrome? What can I discern by this? Crickets. Surfaces have different. Well, Tom's got it. Nitriding. How do you prevent something from getting nitrided? Copper. copper coat it. So what's the pink? Copper. Copper. So they put copper here, 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 here. And they didn't put it on these other spots. So what do you suppose that means? Wherever it's chrome, it's not chrome. It's nitrided. So they nitrided the journals, the lobes, or the, yeah, lobes, um, journals and the gear teeth yeah so interesting now if you have a bad gear you got to buy a whole new shaft if you got a bad shaft got to buy a whole new shaft with the gear uh light combing is now using roller tappets in their engines i do not think continental is and i'm not aware of radial engines all use roller tappets so old radial engines they already had them long 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 time ago um which is nice because I think you can exchange them out. I've never worked on a light coming with these that I'm aware of or can remember, but we have the mushroom type. And we'll talk about that in that little bit. I think I have something else over here. This is the Continental version. That would be a big six cylinder engine. Um, gear comes off, those are the lifters. Note, I think I'll talk about this later. Hydraulic lifters, intake. Hydraulic lifters, exhaust. There is a difference in Continental. And the difference is visible. You can see that this has a bigger black band that has a smaller black band. These are called high lift, and those are the low. High flow and low flow, flow. I knew the lift isn't right. High flow, low flow. Maybe you remember to talk about that. Um, it wasn't always that way. They just used one, and then they made a change and started using these or it was the other way around, I don't remember. But they were, they were matched and they changed one or the other. I don't remember. Uh, let's see. I guess this is your gee whiz information that I've told you before, but proposed engines use a shared intake lobe go back to this picture right here this goes in a four-cylinder engine four-cylinder engine has two valves per cylinder get out of your calculator do the math that should be eight valves but that there are one two three four five six lobes so I don't remember which way. I think this is intake. So it's exhaust, intake, exhaust, exhaust, intake, exhaust, because it's wider, I think. But when you line it up in your case, that's how you can tell which is intake and exhaust. Very simple, the ones that share. And I think I showed everybody that in, uh, in class. Intake, let me see. Radial engines. Radial, um, which would be the cam ring, not cam shaft, um, has two tracks.
Um, two tracks. Uh, you have the intake track and the exhaust track. Let me see. Do I give you a picture of that? Man, I got that. No cam rings. I can try and remember to bring one tomorrow. Um, I'm not going to do that. One ring assembly per two row of cylinders. So every row is obviously going to have its own cam ring because every row works that way. Uh, I wrote ring turns in opposite direction to crank, but I can't be positive all engines do that, so I'm not going to write that. Then there's a formula for cam speed, which is one over number of lobes times two. We don't need to do that. Um, so we can get back in and look at this. Uh, the I, let's see, lobe ramp designed to minimize um, opening and closing shock. Which is to say it's designed to kind of bring everything up to touching and then open it. It doesn't slam it open and slam it closed. It's gentle. All right, this looks like something I must have picked up at the Lycoming School, which causes of cam failure. All right, this is a way bigger deal than you, than you realize, unless you're an aircraft owner. And the reason why is especially for Lycoming owners, the number one failure point on your engine is going to be the cam and lifters. Every, because they're up high. Continental is a little less likely because they're down low, but it's still most likely to be your number one failure item. And when it fails, it is the most expensive thing. If you get a cylinder failure, you know, the compression starts going low, you burn a lot of oil, you at least have the option of taking one of the cylinders off and fixing it. You have the option of taking all the cylinders off and fixing it. But when you have a camshaft failure, you have to take the entire engine apart. And you already know that's a big deal. So you take it apart. You take a six-cylinder Continental. There's also airworthiness directives. Every time you take a six-cylinder Continental apart and you remove the crankshaft from the crank case, which is to me is split the case, you then have to take it the rest of the way apart. You have to do NDT. You have to have ultrasound done. You have to send it out for that. That's exp It just gets really, really expensive. So you do not want your cam to fail for very obvious reasons. Uh, let's see. Number one, I, this may not be in the order, but if it is in the order, I would put this number one. Inactive engine. Just let it sit there. All right, so what if you can't fly your airplane? Yeah, just take it out and just run it up every week. That doesn't sound like it's a thing. It's a thing. Pilots that can't do their, if you can't fly, like we'll get around here, you get the Thule fog and stuff that just rolls in. It's IFR for a month on end, too. So I remember you know, people used to do this all the time where I worked out at Clarksburg. You get the fog out there. You know, and you'd hear them, they'd come out there and just run it up their engine and then shut it down. You're doing more damage than if you would have just left it alone. And the reason why is because you have to get your engine oil. Um, oil has to get 180 degrees because it's going to pick up about another 40 degrees in the engine. Once it goes through, then it comes out, then your oil, you go through a cooler, then you measure it, it's 180. Um, or if you don't have an oil cooler, it just tends to be the... the pickup then going into the engine temperature so if you get your oil at 180 and plus you add another 40 going through the engine you've reached 240, 220 which is about boiling so that means that the water in your oil vape boils off so if you get your oil up high enough it boils off the water that water vapor with the pressure should go out the breather tube and out when you just go out and you run up the engine, you never get the oil up to this temperature. You just can't. If you get the oil up that hot, usually the cylinders aren't getting cooled because it's an air-cooled engine. It needs forward uh, movement. So you, 
right? So that's not, so it's just mismatch. So they weren't designed that way. So you don't get the oil up. So you just go out there and you run your engine up a little bit, which warms up the parts, which warms up the air in the crankcase, which causes it to expand, which goes out the breather, and you just got it a little bit warm. Now you shut it down. Everything around you is full of saturated air. Air inside starts cooling, so it sucks up all, it, it contracting, so it takes all that cold air, sucks it back in, and just adds moisture. That's all it did. You just, hey, I'm gonna go out and grab some more moisture and suck it in there. So now you got more moisture. Plus, you know, you start to get a condensation in there, and then things start to rust. So you're better off just leave it alone. Uh, there are procedures if you're not going to operate your airplane for more than usually 30 days you're supposed to and I, it's terrible I've done it I hate doing it and I don't want to do it to mine because it's expensive too but you're supposed to take your engine oil you can there's preservative oil you see so drain out your oil put it in preservative oil you run the engine and this is the part I hate and as you're running it you're supposed to spray oil up into the carburetors you're shutting it down which means you're to stand next to a moving prop then you're supposed to spray it in the cylinders and then put desk in there and then you're not supposed to move it and it's like oh my goodness so you do that for 30 days and you got to go through this whole procedure to drain it out put fresh oil in and you know i'm not the cheapest guy in the world but man oil is expensive and i hate just throwing it out so uh, two high rpm starts now i write that and i believe that but i was over the covid when i was working with the, my friend of mine, we went out to run up an airplane and I was always taught start up an airplane and run it at the slowest speed that it will run smoothly. So cold engines, they don't run, you know, right all the way back at idle. So, you know, like my, my, my engine, I run it probably 700, 800. Sometimes I get a little carried away and I wasn't paying attention. Ooh, that's a little fast. But, uh, but I was running this engine pretty slow, and he reaches over and he just pushes it right up to about, I don't know, 1100. And I'm like, what are you doing, dude? He's like, hey, we rebuilt this engine and we put this cam in it, and it came with a note from the people who built the cam said low RPM starts are terrible on a cam, that that creates the most pressure. So run it at a high RPM until it warms up, then go to low. And I'm like, ah, I don't know about that. So, uh, thoughts? That's not that fast, really. So, yeah, I, try, I keep mine below a 1,000. Yeah. So, I'm with you on that. Uh, but mine is easier. If, if I'm inactive, I can go out and use the taxiway at um, stall speed until it gets warm. And that works. Yeah. You get an airflow across it and tape up your oil cooler. Uh, let's see. Uh, cold starts without preheat. We don't really see this around here. Uh, I'm not talking 50, 60 degrees, 40 degrees. I'm talking, I forget the number. It's, it's cold. It's like Midwest cold. Um, I, when I flew back to Boston, I mean, I knew these numbers because I was always watching out for it. Um, but if it gets really cold, you need to put a preheater on it. And I read something, you have to be careful with preheaters. Like my airplane came from Minnesota, so it had a heater on it where it had, see my words there, because I live in California, so does my airplane, so I ripped it off for two good reasons. Um, one, plugs in 110. Uh, my particular engine where the, um, this way, this way. Um, this one doesn't have it, but a lot of, most cylinders, have a boss right here. All your light goings do. There's a hole in the bottom with some screw threads. You're like, what is this for? That's where you screw in a cylinder head temp probe. Well, my particular heater that came on my aircraft, they screwed in these uh, bolts that heat it up, and that would heat the cylinders up. Well, I needed those holes for my cylinder head temp, so off that went. Some uh, engine heaters have a band that just goes right here with a, a heating element in there. And then mine had a heating element, it's not about that big, taped to the, glued to the top of the case. My case is that big and it's you know, like that. And then there was one just like it up on the oil sump. Um, I was actually reading recently where 
uh, people were saying that that actually causes more corrosion. Again, it causes um, the air inside of the crankcase to be hotter. Hotter air can hold more moisture, so it allowed more moisture to be in the air. So, um, plus, I just, I don't know. They're okay, but I didn't need it, so off it went. Let me see. Cold starts. Um, valve action or valve misadjustment. That's a mechanic problem. That would be too tight or too loose, either which way. Oh, yeah, sticking valves, right, from the coking action um, and overspeed. So don't do those. So that's the cam. What can I tell you about the cam? When I overhauled engines, for the most part, I wanted to put new cam and new lifters in my overhauls for light combing. Continental, I would go overhauled camshaft would be fine, but always new lifters. For, for whatever reason, when I was overhauling engines, uh, nobody overhauled these. They were, they were just a throwaway item, and I don't think they were really that expensive. So, always got new those, and overhauled cam, light combing, new cam, new lifters. And I think I've mentioned it before, I know I had somebody. In the field, if somebody wants to overhaul, or you, if you're gonna overhaul, send out your cam and lifters to get overhauled, always, always, always have the same company do it all. You know, it doesn't do any good if you if you shop around, you go on eBay, you're like, oh, look, I found some lifters. Now I got to just have my camshaft overhauled. Because what happens is if you run into a problem and you get damage to your lifter, like this has, and you pull it out, it's a low-time engine, you go, dang, this lifter went bad. So you call the company up, go, my lifter's bad. They go, well, send it in. You send it in, they go, yeah, that came from the cam. So you call the cam people, they go, Hey, cam went bad. They go, we'll send in your lifter. Oh, yeah, it's because your lifter went bad. So, you know, it's one of those things. So always get the same company to do both or to same brands. That way, when one goes bad, the other, you can go, well, I don't know if it was the cam or the lifter, but you did both. So, ah, it was the way you oiled it. No. Let's see. So B the follower sometimes called the lifter that is the I'm talking about the part that rides rides against the cam lobe part that rides against the cam lobe the part that fails We got, uh, let me see. We'll call it two types, sort of. Well, I'll just blotch that all up. T Y P, two types. And we'll say we have the uh, roller type, which I showed you in the picture, it actually has a little roller on it. Um, so that is typical. In radial engines, every radial engine I ever worked on had roller tappets, um, and now they are being used. It's kind of a new thing in opposed engines being uh, now now being used in opposed engines. And I think Lycoming is the only one doing that right now. And it is not the same, not the same cam. So you couldn't just pop out your lifters and buy some roller ones and throw it in there. Well, you shouldn't. It's a different camshaft. Uh, let's see. And the other type, type one, 
type two would be the regular tappet. Um, so that is more typical in opposed engines. Um, but there are many different styles. They're typical, but different styles are different. You wouldn't think there are, but you'd be wrong. So those, those, those could be used as a retrofit in my If they allow it, but you have to have a different cam. Right, but they'll, they'll the I don't. Or, it only applies to certain pieces. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see. This was, uh, I don't even have the number. Obviously, it's a light combing service instruction. So, just the different types. You have the straight body, solid, which would be what we have in your 290, 235s. You have the hydraulic spherical. You can see it's got a little dome on it. We have the hydraulic hyperbolic, which got a little fat in the middle there. It's like me after Thanksgiving. And then we have the hydraulic roller tappet, which has a roller and a hydraulic unit. So, Two, three, and four have hydraulic systems in it, which we'll talk about. Let me see. Before installation, apply undiluted lubricant to the face of the tappet. Refer to the latest service instruction of 1059. What does 1059 say to use on the face of the tappet? I'm looking at you because I think you know, Tyler. And yeah, Luber Bond. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yes, yes, that's why I kept standing right. back. I didn't want it on me. So, <laughs> gotta love that. So, I don't know. This, I should I gotta be fair. I don't know what revision I've got here, but, you know, undiluted lubricant. Oh, by the way, that's not what it says. Oh, I guess, uh, yeah, undiluted Luber Bond. Hey. Yeah. Um, yeah, it kind of says, says Luber Bond or other. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So let's see, tap it's different. They're different styles. I just showed you the hyperbolic, the this, that. Um, they are supposed to rotate very slowly in the engine. They're not supposed to just be here because you, you get a wear mark in it. So they they rotate slow. So the cam is actually uh, ground to cause uh, cam and tap it, cam and tap it are ground. Um, to cause rotation. And this will minimize wear. So once installed, once installed and, and run, obviously, uh, cam and followers, cam and followers. are a match set. Meaning it's it's taken a seat to the camshaft, so you should put it back in the same spot. So I don't remember where it says that, so there might be a little bit of that. And I, I, we can't say wives tale anymore because this is a bad, bad thing to say. So we have to come up with a new term for that. So it's a uh, folklore or, <laughs> or what does he say? Um, history tells us, I don't know. Urban so, legend. Yes, uh, urban legend, thank you. Um, could be true, could not be true. As far as I'm concerned, it's true. If I'm gonna take an engine apart uh, with the type you have, with the tappets in it, or any tappet, I'm sorry, any, any tappet, I'm gonna put it back in, absolutely, it goes back in the exact same spot. If I mix them up, I am going to send them out and I'm going to have the whole thing reground. I'm just going to send them out. Hey, you know what? Sorry, I mixed them all up. Somebody's got to pay. Somebody's got to pay to have the cam and lifters reground because I screwed up and got them all in the wrong spot. I'm sure that there would be a lot of people who would say there's no truth to that whatsoever. You're not going to hurt anything. Just put them all back together. But then I say the risk of it is too great. Even if you could convince me <coughs> There's no safety issue whatsoever to anybody on board the aircraft. Um, swear to it, and the whole world agrees to that. 
the worst that could happen is you could have premature wear of the cam and lifter. I'd go, that's enough right there because it is so difficult to take apart and change the camshaft that I would not want to do that. It's very, very, very expensive. And you might be thinking of it in terms of what you have in there, but you have to think of it in terms of starting with a full aircraft, with taking the cowling off, taking the propeller off, taking the exhaust off, the intake system, the oil system, getting it out of the airplane, and that's a full day right there. Uh, two more days to put it back, uh, anyway. Um, however, with these, it is common practice to pull them out of the engine, inspect them, and if you see any problems at all, inspect the cam load. If the cam load lo looks acceptable, throw this away, put a new one in. But that's different than saying, eh, this came out of one, I'll put it in six. All right, that's, that, I think that's different. Well, it is different. I think that, and everybody agrees with me. Um, shake your head. Yeah. So once installed, they're match set. That's why I'm having you keep them in the same spot. And uh, I can promise you this, no student has ever got them in the wrong spot. Um, so that means positions, positions are maintained. Um, normal wear pattern is uh, circles. So the cam is ground in such a way that you would see little tiny circles as it wears. There we go. Little tiny circles as it wears. Um, that has spalling. People are like, what's spalling? Well, it's when it's missing a bunch of metal. But So that's bad. It has spalling. This one has spalling on it. This one has a little tiny bit. Um, if you take a look at the one that has a little bit of spalling, you should be able to run here. You see those little dots? Hardness test. It's where they test the hardness of it. So, normal patterns have little circles. Um, well, the whole thing may be solid or hydraulic. You guys have solid. After the 290 or the 290D2, they went hydraulic. Everything else is hydraulic in the Lycoming line. The 235s, 290D are solid. Everything else, hydraulic. Uh, Continental, every single opposed engine they ever made is that I'm, the, from the 65 on, I'm sure there's something that's not, but um, as far as I know, every single one ever made is hydraulic. Radial engines, all of the ones I've worked on are solid. I don't know what the Pratt & Whitney is. I didn't do much with the Pratt & Whitney's, but I did the Lycomings, the Continentals. They are solid. So whenever you have solid, you have to adjust valves periodically. Hydraulic, you do not. Hydraulic brings its own issues with it, uh, but I'd rather deal with the hydraulic issues any day of the week. So let's talk about the hydraulic systems. Now, one of the the only real drawback, there's two. Two drawbacks to the fact that we're using 290s instead of 320s. Drawback number one is you have a two-piece, uh, you your front bearings look like they're center and rear. All the other engines have a much longer bearing, and there's a little bit of a trick to put those in. Um, not difficult. It's just if you, if you screw up, you know it. When you get the case put together, you can't move the engine. It's just locked solid. I'm like, ah, I screwed up. Bad new bearings. Try again. Uh, you can't fix it. So take it all apart and try it again. So that, and the second thing is that you don't have hydraulic lifters, therefore you're not learning how to assemble an engine with hydraulic lifters. But we have a solution for that. We have solid lifters, therefore I'm teaching you how to deal with solid lifters and how to adjust valves. If you look out into the shop, every one of those Cessnas out there has got all of their cylinders off. The reason why all of the cylinders are off is because Larry is teaching them how to put cylinders on an engine that have hydraulic lifters. So you will get both. 
it just takes a while before you get out there because I don't have time. So you get uh, kind of an engine class all over again from Larry, who is quite good at it. So, um, all right, so hydraulic. Hydraulic units. Um, or sometimes called zero lash, zero lash system. All right, I'm going to go to a picture. All right, let's make heads or tails of this picture right here. This is all the case, this color here. This right here is the... Cam, okay, so we got, and then over here, we've got the hydraulic, the, the lifter. Okay, this is the push rod. Oops. This is the push rod coming in right here. Push rod. And then what's left are the guts inside of there. So we got this right there, pushing against the cam. And inside are the guts. Rule number one with guts, never, never, ever use a magnet on this stuff. All the overhaul manuals say that. Uh, there is a check ball in here, number 10, and they say that if you magnetize this, the check ball will tend to stay magnetized and stick to something and not work properly. Um, so inside of here you have um, number three, it looks like, a cup. A cup. Ooh. Something rings a bell here. Ah, I don't have it. Somewhere I've got a picture of some people who died because a mechanic put the cup on this way. Now when you look at it, it's got a rounded end that goes to the rounded push rod. And it's got a square end that goes like that. In fact, this doesn't even fit that way. People who weren't trained doing things that they weren't supposed to do. So anyway, that is the cup that goes on there. And this right here, this is a two-piece part that is a matched set, like penguins. They're made in for life. There's a trick to getting a part. You push to the right. I can't get it. Huh? Fire? Start move. Ta-da. Okay. They're a matched set. These two pieces are matched. So if I take all of these out of the engine and put them in one spot and all these in the other engine spot, all you need to do is um, throw them away and buy all new ones. So, and the reason why is because these are designed to bleed down at a certain rate. So I suppose you could like put them all back together until you got the bleed rate going just right. But anyway, so this is the hydraulic insert. Rule number one, don't use a magnet. Magnet. Rule number two, don't put the magnet on upside down. And rule number three, match set. Yeah, match set. Don't, don't screw them up. Okay. I got to read this because I'll get it wrong. Basically, what happens is now, in order for this to work, well, we'll kind of do this again tomorrow. In order for this to work, you have to have pressure oil up in here. You don't have pressure oil in the 290. You have trough technology. There's a little trough inside the case. The crankshaft spins oil, it catches the oil in this little trough. There's a little hole drilled that drips down onto the solid lifter and that then drips in around there then it drips down the push rod to it drips on so it's just all drip technology uh, this is all pressure fed so pressure oil comes up through here pressure oil comes through here and enters this area right here you can see on here it's got a little hole in it so that lets the oil get into the inside of what's going on in here 
which is going to work our hydraulic in it, which that's close enough to break time. So I'll let you get some rest and then we'll talk about it tomorrow. And you'll be like, oh, good. I was actually awake. So. <coughs> break, break.